So I watched this Michael Jones versus Matt Dillahunty. I watched it a while ago. It was about a year ago at this point. And I watched it back then and didn't really think all that much of it at the time. Um, but I've started re-watching it again of late. And, you know, I got some good news to report about it. That it's actually a lot... The thing that Michael Jones is presenting in the beginning... Now, in that particular debate, that isn't the clearest presentation of his, of his ideas. What he calls... He calls it a couple of different things. Um, the quantum idealist argument for God, the digital physics argument for God, and then he also calls it like, he's got a couple of different versions of it, that, that he all seems to be under the category of the digital physics argument for God. Now, the good news is this, it's surprisingly close to a provable fact argument for the existence of God. It really is, it's really, really, really close. As far as I can tell, it just needs to be cleaned up a little and then presented more concisely so that it makes complete sense to somebody listening. Obviously that person's got to be intelligent enough to know what time it is and what's going on, but it's actually surprisingly close. And it isn't that dissimilar. There are a lot of variations of this particular argument out there from other sources. One in particular that I've been reading a little bit of late is, his, is Bernardo Castro. Now, Michael Jones is called quantum idealism he calls it quantum idealism. Bernardo Castro calls himself a metaphysical idealist. And his argument is surprisingly similar to Michael Jones. Again, I'm not exactly sure what the difference is. I'd have to go in and... I, I haven't really delved into Michael's argument yet and got, done the background work on it or, or Bernardo's. But they are surprisingly similar. And what, what, what Bernardo Castro will tell you and he will be the first person to say this, is that the reason he has become a metaphysical idealist, he's a trained scientist and has published papers in physics, not alone, but with other people, he has, has some papers published in physics. So this ha guy has the standing to know what he's talking about. A lot of people, when Michael Jones presents versions of these arguments, you'll see in the comments sections, you know, we got a lot of armchair physicists, a lot of really good physicists out there, you do, who, do, who complain about... You know, he's misinterpreting the data, or that's not what the physics say, or that's not what the experiment says. Now, as I've explained when I bring this up, I don't have the standing to go and check a physics paper and decide if that's the correct, you know, if they did the experiments right and things like that. I have no, I'm not a physicist, okay? But Bernardo, conveniently, is. And one thing I've noticed when he shops around his metaphysical idealist postulate is that almost nobody in these, and I've never seen anybody I've seen him present about six or seven times to people who have the standing to challenge the physics and nobody ever says, that's not what the physics say. You're, you're, you don't understand the experiments. Nobody's ever said that to him and I doubt they will. Why? Because he was a trained scientist. Worked for something like 10 years in CERN or something like that in Switzerland building like, I don't even know, supercomputers or some super eggheady thing. He's really obviously super egghead. Michael, Michael Jones is pretty, pretty, pretty egghead. This guy's super egghead. <laughs> I don't think Matt Dillahunty would be able to debate him, honestly. I, I don't see what Matt Dillahunty would do. But, anyways, getting back to the point. So, in this particular debate, what Michael Jones was presented to Matt Dillahunty is pretty darn close. It doesn't get us over the finish line. It needs to be cleaned up a little. But it is pretty darn close to what is being postulated out there in the real material world by actual physicists. That's my point. Surprisingly similar to some of Donald Hoffman's arguments... Um, I can summarize the Bernardo Castro argument I have in other videos. It goes more or less like this. Once upon a time, there was, there was a man named Descartes. And what Descartes did was, you may have heard of Cartesian dualism, was conveniently separate philosophically the world into two camps, quanta and qualia, the world of qualia and the world of stuff. That was really, really helpful to the scientists. Why? Because science went about busying itself studying stuff. And it got really, really far, really, really fast. They would say, like, you know, what happens if we put this stuff in a box and shake it up? And then we write experiments about it. What happens if we eat the stuff? What happens, okay, somebody write that down. If we heat it up for, you know, this is what happens to the stuff. So science moved ahead really, really, really far, really, really fast in, in eliminative materialism. Why? Because it was the study of stuff. And... What, what he is arguing, not me, remember, this isn't me, I'm just translating, just a humble little apologist, okay? Just all shucks, G. Willikers, outside my pay grade, all shucks. I'm just telling you what he says. 
that put us in a box. It put the scientists in a box. Why? Because ultimately they bumped up against the hard problem of consciousness. Now, again, if you're one of these people who think you've solved on the physicalist side, I, I'm not debating that. I'm just translating. And what he will tell you is the hard problem of consciousness is this, is that you are, on the one hand you have stuff, mass, charge, spin, and then you have what it is like to be something, and that the two are in principle irreconcilable one to the other. That they can never, they are ontologically distinct categories of, of, from each other. And that's been the problem the whole time. And he's saying the error is, is that we have postulated that the material world is the actual real world. And that he is arguing according to the physics. And again, he is a physicist to a certain degree. He's not, he doesn't have a PhD in physics. But he has a PhD in some smarty pants, some, some real smarty boots category, I forget what, he's got two. And he has published papers in physics. So take it up with him. I don't agree with this interpretation of the physics. All right, fine. Take it up with him. <laughs> I'd like to see that in the debate. Go to, knock yourself out. <laughs> I'm just telling you what he says. Again, I'm not a physicist. I know you all think I'm great at physics. I'm really not. <laughs> no, nobody thinks I'm great at physics. So what he says, according to the physics themselves, the latest postulates, the latest interpretations of the physics themselves, the latest implications, it's very similar to what Michael Jones is arguing that what they are saying is that there is no standalone ontology prior to measurement. In other words, what? What? There's no standalone ontology prior to measurement. Nothing exists prior to measurement. That seems to be the implication of the physics themselves. What does that mean? In short, there is no spoon. There is no spoon. The matrix is right. The real material world as we know it isn't technically there prior to measurement. Now, there are other ways of interpreting that, that isn't, that, that's, that's wildly speculative what I just said, that's his interpretation, or kind of his. The implication being that what he will start to argue, and, and he'll be the first to tell you, see, Michael Jones is a, is a Christian apologist, so am I, um, Bernardo Kastrup is not. He's not even a Christian, so it's not even necessarily a theist interpretation of reality. It just sits very well. It, it's very, very similar to what Michael Jones is arguing with this quantum idealism argument. It's very similar. What the differences are, I'm not sure. I'm gonna, I have to go look really deeply at both of them to tell you what the differences actually are. But at first glance, they're really similar. And what he is arguing, okay, uh, where did I go? There is no spoon, there is no real material world prior to measurement, is that the only thing... The ontological primitive is actually consciousness itself. The only thing that we can be sure actually exists is that which observes. Now that's speculative to a degree, but he'll be the first person to tell you that he has come to the conclusion on, based on it being the most parsimonious and the most logical conclusion of the empirical data. In other words, it's the best case scenario, it's the best conclusion that can possibly be come to, fits what, most well with the data the, the break, biggest breakthrough frontiers in physics themselves. That's what he will argue. I don't quite have the standing to tell you for a fact that he's telling the truth. But a lot of what he says makes a lot of sense and it lines up pretty closely to Michael Jones. So, where does that put us with Michael Jones' debate with, with Matt Dillahunty? In the debate with Matt Dillahunty, Matt Dillahunty does what a lot of you refer to as the Dillahunty Dodge. It's not quite fair. It's not fair. You're not being fair to Matt Dillon. <laughs> You're not being fair. You're beating up on poor Matt Dillon. You're bullying him. All right, so the Dillon Hunty Dodge goes something like, and he did it in this debate. He goes something like, you know, I don't need to come up with an alternative explanation. You, you know, I just don't accept that what you are saying points to God. Now, if you are presenting an argument for God, the Dillon Hunty Dodge is actually correct. So let's say I'm in a debate with Matt Dillahunty and I'm like trying to prove God to him and I go, here, Matt Dillahunty, the Kalam cosmological argument. He is under no obligation if I present Kalam cosmological argument or here, here's a contingency argument, Matt Dillahunty. He is under no obligation, zero, not one. He's right about this, to come up with an alternative explanation. He need only debunk, dismiss, and discredit you. That's it. That's all he needs to do. You're presenting something that you are arguing proves God. He doesn't have to come up with an alternative explanation. He just needs to show you how that, that argument doesn't work. Do you understand? So usually when you have, an when you have a debate with Matt Dillahunty and you're trying to prove God through your, 
your contingency argument or whatever weak ass argument you're presenting. <laughs> your arguments suck, face facts. So you want to be no, I'm just kidding. Uh, contingency is okay. Kalam, don't even get me started on the Kalam. Um, he is under no obligation to come up with an alternative explanation for the data you present. That is not true of the quantum idealist argument. It's not true at all. He is very much under an obligation. Why? Because he is the philosopher king generally accepted to be the philosopher king of the atheist community. And, and what Michael Jones is actually saying, he didn't quite say it well enough in this debate to really hammer the point home, but what he's actually saying is that this is one of the most parsimonious conclusions of the empirical data according to the science itself. Bang! Matt Dillahunty is under a lot of obligation to go and to research that for himself. Bang! Yes, he is. Yes, he is. He doesn't have to go watch my <laughs> Inspiring Philosophy videos. Again, if, uh, Inspiring Philosophy, it's, it's, he's got to clean up his, his version of it. But it's almost there. Uh, the Bernardo Castro is easy to understand. And Matt Dillahunty ultimately will be under some obligation. We can hold him to account. He can't just say, this doesn't say what you say it says, and this doesn't point to God. He's going to have to go look for himself. Integrity will demand that he does that. He's got to have to be accountable, too. Why? Because this seems to be, what, what is being argued is that this is what the frontiers of science actually point to. That's what Bernardo Castro is arguing, that he is making the most parsimonious, most evidence-based conclusion. It's philosophy ultimately, but is based on empirical observation of the data itself. That's what he would tell you. He's a scientist, not a Christian. He's not a Christian and not a philosopher first, first and foremost. First and foremost, and that's what he was trained as a scientist. So Matt Dillahunty is under some obligation to go and examine the data for himself, and if he doesn't accept that for whatever reason, he'll probably find it, you know, it's surprisingly easy to understand, makes a lot of sense. I've never seen anybody successfully argue against him at all, even cl come close, honestly. And I can't imagine Matt Dillahunty would either. Either guy's like an intellectual freight train when he gets his thing up and running, he just starts talking about it. It's like everything he, he points to, now it doesn't all quite, gel nicely, and he's certainly no Christian. My only point is that Matt Dillahunty can't just hand wave it away as, you know, I'm under no obligation to come up with an alternative explanation. In this particular era, he is under some I I integrity itself would demand that he is obliged to go and take a look at this for himself and research it for himself and actually read the book and see. Integrity would demand that, and we can start holding him accountable. If Michael Johnson presented a cleaner, more easy to understand version in that debate, he could have almost done it in that debate. That's where he was going. He's like, this is what the evidence suggests. And ultimately, if we're right and we're pointing to an evidence-based conclusion, absolutely you're obliged to go check it out. You certainly are. You certainly are. You aren't. That's what I mean. He's the philosopher king of the atheist community. He's not just a Dumbo on Twitter. Dumb on Twitter now. He'll just go, that's not evidence. That's exactly what I'll say. I swear to God, that's what I'll say. That's not evidence. I said evidence. This guy here thinks that, you know, 50 things he imagined is evidence. This is not a product of my imagination. And the quantum idealist argument is not a product of Michael Jones's imagination. It needs to be cleaned up a little and presented properly. But it is almost there. They are very, very similar things. The thing that Bernardo Castro will argue out of his own mouth, I've heard him do it. This is not my presentation. Is that the ontological primitive is consciousness itself. And that there is even some evidence, this is Michael Jones has said this and so is Bernardo Castro, that the universe itself is a type of nervous system. Now, Michael Jones, or uh, which one am I talking about? <laughs> Bernardo, which, which, I get them confused now. But Bernardo will argue... The reason why he's not a theist, I mean, the most obvious question is, why don't you think that's God? He's arguing that it's consciousness itself, that we're all part of some big universal consciousness, man. It's all so beautiful, bro. And we're just flowing in mind, dog. And there is no real world because he's got very, very complex technical explanations as to why there appears to be a real material world and we all seem to share the same reality. It's no, there's no woo artistry in this at all. He ain't Deepak Chopra. But actually, Deepak Chopra is smarter than you think, too. So that's not act that, that's an insult to the atheist community. But if you go listen to some of the Deepak Chopra stuff, you know, you, you, you won't think that anymore. But he ain't no Deepak Chopra. He is arguing that this is the most parsimonious, um, empirically driven 
conclusion based on the sign, the frontiers of science and the evidence itself. He is not a Christian. So, um, I don't know if I want to go in detail. I'll go into detail with this whole spiel. Um, he, what he basically argues is consciousness itself is the ontological primitive. We are all part of what he calls um, universal consciousness from across a dissociative boundary. Transpersonal universal consciousness from across a dissociative boundary. Yeah, that's a mouthful. <laughs> that's, not, that's, that's not a great way of saying something, but that's what he is arguing. He's arguing that the physics himself and the science itself points to that as the most obvious conclusion. That the mistake we made was dividing reality into two camps material reality and quantitative reality. And now we come up against the hard problem of, of consciousness because we are perceiving things wrong. From the jump, we are making a fundamental error in how we are... Um, I don't know how, how deep I can get into this in the video right now. Let me see where I'm at. 15 minutes. Um, we are making a fundamental error that we made all the, going all the way back to Descartes and how we parse out reality itself. It helped us. It helped us do measurements on stuff and come to scientific conclusions, and science ran way ahead of the curve and, to a certain degree, imprisoned us. Imprisoned us in our imaginations because we started thinking as the real material, material world as the ontological primitive, as the thing for which we don't have to account for, the, the miracle that undergirds it all, let's say. That's how he calls it. I would just call it the foundation, something like that. That the, the, the typical materialist, reductive materialist, thinks of stuff as the actual ontological primitive. It's the actual, what the world is comprised of is stuff. He's arguing that's the mistake right there. And that's what's led to the errors. Um, because then when you wind up against, you know, the... Well, you, there are a couple of things that it leads to. One, the hard problem of consciousness, which I defined according to him, not according to me. It's not, I'm just I'm an apologist. I'm just telling you what he's saying. Um, and then two, the the measurement problem in physics. And the measurement problem at the, at the most fundamental level, what the most most likely interpretive framework, again, according to him, I understand there's different interpretations of physics. I get that. But according to him, the physics themselves are pointing to the idea that there is, that the real material world is to some degree an illusion. Not necessarily an illusion, but with, uh, the only thing we can know for sure that is there and that actually exists is that which is doing the observing, that which observes, or that which takes the measurement to begin with, which is you, which is consciousness itself. So that's what he's arguing is the fundamental mistake. And once we set that mistake properly, then from that, all other ideas are going to flow and line up nicely. Now, if he's right, it's a big if, but if he's right, the impact of what he's saying will be revolutionary, in a way, transformational in the consciousness of humanity. Um, the only thing that I'm bringing up is that Matt Dillahunty can't just say, uh, you know, it, it's not necessarily an argument for the existence of God. It dovetails really nicely with Christianity, because, you know, the consciousness that undergirds the entire universe, I could just say, well, that's Jesus Christ. What, what I've been telling you all the time. But I just discovered that in my prayer closet, and he had to do all these complicated, you know, <laughs> all these complicated experiments. Um, the point is, Matt Dillahunty, whereas you present a, cos a Kalam cosmological argument to him, He's under no obligation to come up with an alternative explanation. He's, not, he's under no obligation to tell you how, you know, did things begin to exist. He's right about that. Why? Because he's not the physicist. But with this, he is under some obligation to actually go and research for himself. Why? Because he's smart enough to understand it to some degree. And, and he, want, he has said out of his own mouth he wants to believe things that are evidence-based and true. And that what Bernardo is arguing... Again, very similar argument to Michael Jones's. What the difference is, I'm not sure, but what he's arguing is that this is the most parsimonious evidence-based conclusion on the empirically observable data. The, and his argument is surprisingly similar to a lot of other high-brained arguments out there. There's a lot of variations on the same theme. So, that's why I say Matt Dillahunty ultimately will be under some obligation to actually go and, and wrestle with it for himself and check for himself. Which he probably did with the Kalam cosmological arguments and the contingency arguments, to be perfectly honest. That's why he, he, he makes such short work of those debates. Because he probably did go and wrestle with them, 
and figured out the flaws in them, and that's why it's, it's not really that much of a, a debate when, when you bring one of those arguments to him, is that he's already investigated enough to know the weakness. This is, this is different. This is very different. My, the Michael Jones one, you clean it up a little, there's probably not going to be a weakness. That's the point. If Bernardo Castro, assuming all the physics are correct, which I have no standing to, to see, but I've seen him debate this and present this to people who very much have the standing to challenge the underlying assumptions and the underlying scientific investigations, and they don't. They very much have the standing to do that, and they don't, which is really important detail. They could say to him at any time, that's not what the physics say, and nobody does, that you're misinterpreting that experiment, and nobody does, and this is all heavily footnoted in his books, and nobody, I've never seen anybody challenge that. So Matt Dillahunty will be obliged to go check this out for himself. And you know, coming up with a better explanation, that's just not on the table. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Okay, He's going to have to yield to some degree, I promise. He's going to have to. Why? Because it just makes too much sense. The guy, if the guy's right, forget it. Some, something fundamental has shifted in how we perceive reality. It will be revolutionary in its, in its impact. I foresee that to some degree. Because it's basically a reimagining of the way we perceive reality. I mean, he's, he, he's, he was most influenced by Schopenhauer. And it's, it's a, it's a lot, has a lot to do, if you study Kant, Kant makes a really big deal of the noumena phenomena distinction. The, there's the phenomena, which is what we experience. And then there's the thing in itself, which is, which is what we really have no access to. Think about it this way, when you perceive a color, there's no such thing as a color intrinsic to something. We all understand that, right? Color is not an actual, it's not an actual observable phenomenon. It's something we experience as color. The, the, it's, or, or sound, same idea. When you're actually observing sound, you're not hearing a concert, you are observing vibrations, you can study the vibrations and things in the air and how it hits somebody's eardrum, but none of that makes any sense until it is re-represented back to you, the conscious agent, as, you know, a concert. The data itself is meaningless. That's part of what he's saying and pointing out. The data itself is ultimately meaningless. We have attached too much talismanic power to it, why? Because we have built really cool gadgets off of our observations. And we have misunderstood, to some degree, the thing we are studying with reality itself, when the only thing that truly exists in the... I mean, this isn't probably the way he would want me to say it, but the only thing that truly... <laughs> the thing that always... Whenever I'm listening to him, the only thing that always pops up in my mind is like, the original postulate according to the Grateful Dead. This is all a dream we dream one afternoon long ago. That's the original postulate. It's all a dream, man. We're all like flowing in this universal consciousness, bro. And it's like just so cool, man. It's, it's very similar to that. I swear to God. It, it made a lot of sense to me. But I, I've read a lot of stuff that's, you know, he's, he's steeped in Jung, Jungian. He's steeped in Jungian analysis. He's steeped in Schopenhauer. Emerson it matches up with Emerson. Matches up with a lot of stuff that I was I was into long before I became a Christian, and it dovetails really nicely with a certain way of being a Christian. It kind of sort of matches up nicely with some of what Michael Jones is saying in his quantum idealist arguments. That's the point. That's why I brought it up. We're almost there. We're almost there. How I see it, uh, should I do this? I'm probably yapping too much. But how I see it is that there are two things. Stephanie will tell you this. Stephanie brought this up one time in a video a long time ago. There's the transcendent and there is the imminent. Those are the two attributes of God that, that in, according to theology, transcendent is generic God. When we were making an argument like the Kalam cosmological argument, we aren't talking about Jesus Christ. Matt Dillahunty would be the first person to point that out. We're just talking generically some sort of deist like God thingy. God in general. Okay, that God seems to be found according to the physics. We can prove that one to you according to empirical investigation and according to the, to the most parsimonious interpretation of the physics themselves. That's the point. God imminent, which is Jesus Christ, hallelujah to the Lamb of God, only Son of God, that you have to make a choice. You find that God in prayer. 
you ask that God, Jesus, come into my heart and guide me. That's a personal God. So there's two attributes of God that we're talking about. God according to the physics. Now, if you listen to Bernard, I'll go into this in detail because some of this will blow your mind. The type of things he is talking about is quantum entanglements. Uh, it's really hard to explain off the top of my head. But, like, he is talking about a universal consciousness as provable fact. Transcendent other that I talk about as provable fact. He's, he's not calling it God. Why? Because he doesn't think it has a... He does, exactly for the same reason an atheist wouldn't call it God. Because, it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't care when he cries, he doesn't pray to it, it doesn't, like, you know, follow him around, watch when he falls down, and, like, he doesn't feel any personal connection to it, like it has any personal, like, love for him or anything like that. So it's not God imminent. That is probably only something you can find through prayer. Through faith, through being, you know, one of these, what are, what are we called, little children Christian like myself. You know, I'm not talking, I don't need his cool physics explanation of the universe to prove God. I don't. I'm perfectly content with my little fairy tale version of God, my personal God, my Jesus Christ, the friend who sticks closer than a brother. I'm just telling you, when these big smarty boots guys come around and they're like, oh man, you're so stupid, you got no evidence for God, we can hit them with the physics. Go, oh yeah? <laughs> oh yeah, we don't? You should eat it. Eat it. Read it and weep. Read it and weep, you imbeciles. And if they say, that doesn't say what you think it says, we'll go, I'll take it up with Bernardo. Or take it up with Donald Hoffman. Transcendent other as thing being explored by physics itself. Provable fact. We're right on the doorstep of that, kids. We're right on the doorstep of that. So I see this thing, even if you don't think that Bernardo's found a personal God, he doesn't think it's a personal God. It's close enough that, he, he, any way you slice it, we're looking at a revolution, some degree of a revolution in human consciousness. We really are. There, there, it's, I, I, I'll, I won't say that firmly yet, but I'll keep watching his stuff and keep going into the well and digging into what he's saying. I'm almost positive that's what, what's going on. So, that's what time I think it is. You know, we'll see. We'll see. That is all for now, kids. The mass has ended. Yeah, I was a little rambly. I apologize. <laughs> it's the first time trying to talk about it, you know. <laughs> um, I don't know what to tell you. It's a YouTube video, ultimately. I kind of misrepresented him a little, but, you know, I apologize for that. Um, I'll clean it up. Videos to come. And we'll see. I think it's a slam dunk. I really do. So, there you have it, kids. That is all for now. Mass has ended. Go in peace. Amen.